And I want to thank you all for inviting us to, to be with you and share together um, this morning. Uh, it, it's a real encouragement, to, of course, to, to be together, and I, I particularly appreciate y'all's willingness and desire to, you know, to uh, be connected to us at the Institute. Um, I didn't anticipate saying much about that. But uh, just very briefly, I will. It's a small school. We're 50 students, and it's a two-year program that's all Bible. You'd probably best think of it as a missionary slash discipleship training center because it's more than just classroom stuff. We emphasize prayer in a major extent that students there, the way we've set things up, learn to pray. They'll pray usually about an hour and a half every day because it's broken up into 30-minute type of segments because for us, that's the missing key in God's work worldwide. That as the founder of the school was um, often said, he said so many, even with missionaries, he says, Prayer is incidental and not fundamental to what they do. Well, he wanted to correct that. And so that's deeply embedded in the school is uh, programs, scheduled times of prayer so that students will learn the blessedness and the benefit of it. And we can actually see God move and work in wonderful ways. So um, that's very much heart and hand with you all here and what vision the Lord's given you. From the school now, which has been there since the 70s, there are close to 100 missionaries around the world in 22 different uh, countries. So it's a little, we're a little insignificant little school uh, in the world's eyes, but uh, we trust that God has done something way, way bigger than any of us can, can really see. But so thank you. We'll most assuredly welcome uh, connections and, and fellowship and with, with you all here. And uh, it's just a blessed uh, privilege to be here. Uh, for many of you, I am known as Amy's husband, you know. <laughs> and you know, I'm okay with that, you know. you. You got the blessed benefits of hearing her speak on that weekend women's retreat. And, you know, I get to hear her every morning, you know, and it isn't, um, she, she has uh, wonderful insights uh, to share. And so here are two, you also have seven of my 11 children that are here, but, um, uh, my other connection with you all is that I've known Benji for I don't know how long since he was a little boy and with Miss Davies and the Clems were baseball coaches for my at least one or more of my sons. So, yes, we're very connected to you all and very glad and grateful for it. So let's uh, pray together as we come to God's word. <clears throat> Father, we do come with joy and thanksgiving to you. You're always so wonderful in all your works, in all your ways. Uh, it makes us so long for heaven when we can really see you and experience you in your fullness. Now, we see through a glass dimly, darkly, but that much is glorious to us. But one day, that'll be taken away, and we'll see you as you are. And then we'll know, even as we're known, how wonderful that day will be. So meet us, though, in this time, in this veiled world we live in, that we might see more and more of you as we gaze more and more intently upon you. So we commit this time into your hands that you will meet it, uh, us in it, and you will use it and uh, by your Holy Spirit to apply your truth to our hearts to make positive, definite changes. And all this we ask of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're thinking about prayer, I think you can um, think in this regard. 
they're really, uh, think of two tributaries that flow together to make this big river we call prayer. One of those tributaries you are all very well familiar with. Everybody is. Even lost people are well aware of this much. With lost people, this means uh, just a sense of need. Even lost people will cry out to God in a pinch, won't they? They forget Him just as fast when the need is met, but this is a sense of need drives prayer, does it not? Um, when I went to college at Furman, I had just come to know the Lord like a year before that. And so when I went to Furman, I and a few others of us started a um, evening by, uh, prayer meeting. People would come and usually there were only five or six of us. And we'd meet in one of the dorm rooms and we'd pray for a little bit, sing something and pray and, and then say goodnight to each other. And that'd be that. Well, when it got near midterms, <laughs> you, you already know what's going to happen. It was like flowing into the hall. You know, there were so many guys in that room that it was flooded, you know, and they're all... You know, it all goofed off the entire semester and said, man, alive, I need some prayer now. You know, I'm going to, you know, flunk this course or lose my scholarship. So, yeah, they had a profound sense of need and that drove them to their knees. And so, yeah, they were all packed into that room and we had a big prayer meeting. What do you suppose happened when the midterms were over? Well, we didn't see any of them again as the need was gone. Well, understand this much about prayer. We need him for everything, constantly. Doesn't the, didn't our Lord say, apart from me, John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. In John 6, 63, he says, for the spirit quickens, but the flesh profits nothing. Ow. Wow. So what does that tell us? Is that we need him all the time. Now, I think for real prayer warriors, that's deeply embedded within them. They have a profound sense of inadequacy. Constantly that I can't do this without the Lord. I can't do anything of any eternal value unless God's hand is in it. That is deeply embedded in the heart of every intercessor and every man or woman of God is that I'm nothing and he is all. I would be daily taught. That is the tributary that really floods the prayer life. That much we have to come to terms with. Now, it's not something intuitive to you and me. I want you to think for a minute about a graph. If I had known I could have used a PowerPoint, I might have helped you out here. I want you to think of something here. Think about the horizontal line is time and think of this vertical line as independence. Now, what I want you to understand is that the phys physical growth and spiritual growth are exact opposites. Physical growth, here's independence. You're born totally dependent, aren't you? Yeah, you mothers know that. And they, a little baby can't even roll over on their own. They, you have to do ab absolutely everything. The only thing they're good at is messing up their diapers and crying and sleeping and eating. And that's it. That's their whole entire world. But you have to take care of pretty much all of it in terms of feeding and keeping them clean and all of that. Well, little by little they suddenly can roll over on them and then they can sit up and, and then they can eat 
without being spoon fed and they eat on their own and and then they begin to walk and, and, and then they can run and dress themselves and what they're growing more and more independent and we celebrate it. Mom said, good, you know, these things you can do for yourselves. So real growth physically until they get to the point where they don't really need you at all. And you're glad <laughs> that they don't. So you celebrate that. And that's a good thing. They may like you, but they don't need you. Good for you. You've done a good job as a parent. Spiritually speaking, it's the exact opposite because we come to God all too independent of him, don't we? We think we can handle life. We think we know what to do. We think we know what's best for ourselves and good many other people around us. We think we can good enough to go to heaven. And then something happens. The Spirit of God begins to work on us and we begin to see, you know what? I am not up to God's standards. I, I can't do this. I can't live up to what he commands in his word. And we come to the point of realizing my good works are not adequate. They're not sufficient. And I'm in big trouble here. And there's no way I can fix it. So I have to depend on Jesus Christ, on his shed blood and his righteousness put to my account because I have none of my own. So now I realize I'm totally dependent on him for my salvation or there isn't any. That, though, is just the beginning. Then you begin to learn, you know what? I need him for wisdom. I need him for strength. I need him for grace. I don't know how to live the Christian life. I need him for power. The real men and women of God, they grow more and more dependent upon him until you can find someone like George Mueller, who at one point someone noticed he was writing uh, down a letter and every once in a while he would stop and and pray, and then he'd go back to writing, and somebody said, well, what are you doing there? He said, this pen isn't working right. I'm asking the Lord to, to fix it. You know, he'd pray about everything, down to the real detail. Why? Because he knows, number one, God is the answer, and he has a profound sense of need. Mr. Carroll used to tell us at the school, he would, teaching us these things, he said, look, Pray first, think later. We do just the opposite, don't we? Uh, we think and think, and we're, what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? And we get it all. There's a terrible story of missionary. Uh, it's still funny. I'm sorry. I have a twisted sense of humor in it all. But um, I mean, these missionaries in Japan, and you know, the dollar and the yen fluctuate in value. And so if the dollar, you know, loses value, they could lose 20% of their income almost overnight. And it had been down for a long time. And these missionaries that pooled their money, and they had tried everything they could to, to make it work. And so they had a big missionary meeting and, and, and they said, look, we've tried everything we can to stretch the money and to make it work, but we're all going to have to take cuts and, and everything and, and said there's, there's nothing left to do but, but pray. And, and some woman at the back said, oh no, has it come to that? <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> this is a missionary. But that's us, isn't it? We're like that. And anything but prayer that's the, you don't go there until you have no other option. Well, look, make it your first option every time. And so he did teach us this. I remember I was working, we, we built those dormitories ourselves. That cut the cost in half. But I remember my job, we were finishing up a woman's dorm. And my job that day was to put in shower rods 
and y'all know, probably put in enough of them to know, there's the type, you just kind of keep screwing them and they pressure on the sides of the shower and they then you hang things on them. But they always have rubber gaskets on the end so you won't just snap the tile or whatever. Okay, so I'm doing that, but we did not put the drain covers on the drains. And so I'm doing this and that rubber gasket falls off the end of the shower rod. I watch it hit, I'm somewhat on a ladder, and I thought, no, 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 no. <laughs> it rolls right towards the drain and disappears. <laughs> now, I had to think this much, ah, woman's dorm, washing hair, hair collecting on rubber gasket, stopping up drain, flooding room, you know, all this, I realized. But I knew, okay, I thought, okay, pray uh, first. Uh, so I went to a brother who was in the room and said, look, we need to pray. And I said, Lord, I said, this is your dorm. We've got a problem here. Lord, we just committed to you. What, do you, what can we do? Lord, show us what to do. I, I'm telling you the truth now. No sooner I said amen, then this picture came to my mind, and it was, take a, a step. I could still see it, but it's hard rubber. I couldn't poke it or anything, and I couldn't get my hand in it. And it said, take a long stick and fold duct tape on the end of it, because duct tape fixes everything anyway. <laughs> and just go down there and gently stick that on the gasket and, and pull it up and then you'll, you'll have it. Now I'm going to tell you, I didn't think about that. That was God gave it to me. Proverbs 16 3 says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. So pray first, Lord, give me wisdom here. Just show me what to do. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He gives to all men abundantly and he never scolds you for asking. He wants you to ask. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Ask and you'll receive. You have not because you ask not. But the really godly people have a profound sense of inadequacy and constant spiritual neediness, which makes you a constant man or woman of prayer. Whenever you're talking to somebody, Lord, just give me wisdom to, to speak to them. I do counseling, and every time I counsel with somebody, I'm asking for God's wisdom. And sometimes they start talking, and my mind's going like this, and I'm thinking about, well, it's probably this, it might be that. But I can't tell you how many times I stop and pray, and the first thoughts that come to my mind are completely different from what I was thinking about. That's the Lord giving you what you need to meet other people's needs. So if you and I, that's the first big tributary that I think flows into making a man or woman a prayer is that you know you can't do it. That you know you have need, deep need. Or people around you have deep need, but you're not adequate to meet it. So we go to our great God. That's one tributary. But I want to really talk to you today about another one. The other tributary that flows into this. And that second tributary is that you love his presence. This is uncommon. As I said, everybody calls on God's name in one time or another. But this one, this is different. That this, though, also fuels prayer, is that you learn to enjoy his presence. You know, I love what our Presbyterian brothers say in their Westminster Confession of Faith. It's a catechism. What is man's chief end? or chief purpose in life? And the kids are supposed to answer, 
to glorify God. And then I'm so glad they added this and enjoy him forever. It's not just about doing stuff for God that brings glory to him. Yes, that's true. But it's also enjoying him, finding delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires uh, of his heart, of your heart, because they'll be one with his. So learning to actually just enjoy God's presence actually is one of the bigger tributaries that fuels prayer, that you enjoy being with him and sitting in his presence. I know this is not common, but let's look at one who got it. He got it. Look at Psalm 27. This is David. <clears throat> David is the king of Israel. He's the top man here. He has everything he asked for in one sense. There are those to do it for him. But he's also a godly man. I'll begin in Psalm 27. We're going to settle in on another verse further in. But let's begin Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh... My adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Because, why? Because the Lord's my light and my salvation. So his face in the Lord and he's seen God do wonderful, wonderful things for him and protect him from his enemies and keep them at bay. Now look what he says in verse 4. One thing I have asked from the Lord, and that I shall seek. Oh, okay. Now, so David said, it's almost like this. As he said, okay, if I could ask just one thing of you, Lord, it would be this. Now, he's the king. What? might have he asked for? Well, he could say, I want it peace. I, I want you to keep my, all my enemies at bay or give me wonderful triumph and power over all uh, my enemies. He could ask for military dominance and victory. He could have asked for prosperity, that you would cause my people to prosper and our barns to be filled and our vines overflowing. He could have asked for that too. Or he could have even asked like his son would ask Solomon and said, wisdom, good prayer. Give me wisdom to lead this great people. But look what uh, David asked for. It was so much bigger and better than wisdom. He asked for God himself. <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, wisdom's fine to help you live your life, but he asked for a relationship with the Lord himself. Look what he says. One thing I have asked from the Lord, and that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to do what? It's not just being there and away from here. It's to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. He wants to see the Lord. He wants to know him, to behold him, to gaze upon him, to admire him for his excellencies and his beauties and just to be there gazing on God. That, when you get to that point, you know, prayer, your, your quiet time isn't going to become a religious ritual to you or some burdensome religious duty. 
It will be the delight of your day to just be with the Lord. Now, I know that we're so used to the, this first tributary. We don't really take time to do this. Look what comes next here. Verse 5, for in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. Now, this is just even spiritually speaking, you can be kept in perfect peace because your mind is stayed on him. He will lift me up on a rock and now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer up in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and be gracious to me and answer me. Now, here's how we would say this. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, thy hand, Lord, I shall seek. <laughs> No, that isn't what he said. But it's what we do, isn't it? When the Lord says, seek my face, we say, we seek his hand. There's a big difference. When you gaze at somebody's face, that, for us and in the Bible, that's getting to know them. You can read them a little bit. You, you can understand them. To, to see someone's face was to fellowship with them, to engage in some intimate companionship with them. If you just want their hand, you want them to do something for them. So here, I think, is one of the big, big parts of prayer that gets omitted. That we're so used to treating God like a, a celestial ATM machine that we just go to him and get what we need out of him and we're on our way to do the next thing. But learn to cultivate your relationship with him in the quietness. Now, when I was a young guy, uh, we started okay at Furman, but then, wow, as any of you know anything about Furman, it is anything but a godly school, quite the contrary and proud of it. That to oppose the things of God. And so I was in war, spiritual warfare. They did not steal my faith, but they did steal my joy. I let them do it because I was just mad at them, chronically angry at denigrating God every class I went into. So I was not happy with them at all and fought them. But it, it just sucked the life out of me. And so I was in the first class of the Institute and just a beaten up spiritual warrior there, been wounded. And so and I didn't have a whole lot of joy left, just so much combat I had been in. Um, I began to just wonder, you know, you know, where am I? I said, am I even saved? I don't have any joy here. And, so I was so full of self-doubt and accusations, discouragement, and, you know, it was really difficult. Well, these truths were a turning point in my life. Mr. Carroll said, emphasizing this, he said, okay, here's what I want you to do. Later on, I found out maybe that isn't exactly what he said, but I thought it was an assignment. He said, when you pray this afternoon, uh, I want all of you to spend the first 15 minutes in doing nothing but worship the Lord. Okay, I took it as an assignment, therefore I've got to do it. And so I start doing this and I said every nice thing about God I could in about five minutes. And you know, so I just repeated it the next five minutes and and did the same thing the next five minutes and, you know, and got that assignment checked off and on my way. But I thought he wanted us to keep doing this over and over again. Let me tell you what happened as a result of that. I started noticing, some days I didn't do it, and I noticed that my attitudes and my faith had 
diminished. But when I did just focus on the Lord alone, not on my needs, if I focused on who God was rather than focusing on who I'm not, I noticed that my whole outlook on life changed. There is a beautiful benefit in keeping God first and worshiping Him. Now, there are two wonderful things that happen as a result of this. Number one, you and I will become like him. We're changed, as was I. Look at 2 Corinthians, way back over to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is a principle in God's word and a powerful one. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, or better to translate it, where the Spirit is Lord of a life, there's liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are what? What happens when you do that? What happens when you behold God? When you look on Him and dwell on Him, you are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Wow. You can be changed, made more like Christ simply by gazing on Jesus Christ. Now, this is a spiritual law that you'll find all through the Bible. You become like what you worship. If someone worships money, they become like what goes with it, full of dissatisfaction, fear, and greed. If people worship or look at other people's opinions of them, they generally get what goes with that is fear. But in another respect, think about the Pharisees. What did the Pharisees worship? They didn't really worship God. No, they worshiped the law of God. That's what had their focus was the laws of God. And so what kind of people did they become? They became like what they worshiped. They were hard. They were critical, judgmentative, and inflexible. That's exactly what the law is. You become like what you worship. But when you worship the Lord of glory, he transforms you. He says that, uh, that thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. What is you become a partaker of God's peace? If you go to him and gaze on him, you begin to be like him in your outlook and your attitudes. That's one blessed benefit of worship. So what else can we say? Well, the other advantage to this is that your faith, like mine did when I became a worshiper of the Lord, my faith began to grow. Now, flip over to another passage. This is Romans chapter 4. Well, flip back to Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> We're going to begin reading in verse 18, but just to summarize what he's talking about here, of course, he, he's, he's proved, Paul's proving to Jews and Gentiles in this chapter that God's way is the way of faith, and Abraham is exhibit A, that he believed God, and God counted it to him for righteousness. But it was extraordinary, the kind of faith that Abraham expressed here. And it is in regards to the promised child, Isaac, that you would have a child. But look at the setting for it. 
in hope, verse 18, in hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations, not just Jews, but Gentiles, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated, he knew the, he knew the score here. He, he knew what his own body was. It was as good as dead. Since he was a hundred years old, and he knew that Sarah had been barren her entire life. And she was 90, actually. So he knows that, you know, from a human perspective, this is um, game over. This is not going to happen by any human means at all. So it's pretty far-fetched to think that you're going to have a son that God said you would. But how did he muster that kind of faith? Verse 20, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith. How? Some of the translation, as he gave glory to God or by giving glory to God. Now, here's a big, big key for prayer and intercession. If you're struggling to believe God for something, well, then worship him in the area of your need. And faith will grow. Your faith grows by looking at the object of your faith. Your faith will diminish if you dwell on the problems. It will. The more you look at your problems, the bigger they will become to you. When I was a young man, um, it, that's also first year at Furman, and I, I made a decision and then I, I immediately thought, you have totally messed up. You should never have done that. And now there's no real way to correct it. It wasn't sinful. It was just not... I didn't think it was wise or smart or something. And I was really, really upset by it. I mean, really broken up, weepy broken up. And I was really late at night, and I was walking along uh, in the Furman uh, football practice field and just head down and just moping, really. And I just, you know, leaned against the, the goal post, and how could I have done this? There's no way to fix it. How stupid. I am, and I, there's just a mess. And I guess I got tired of looking down, and I just looked up. And suddenly it was a cloudless night, and the stars were just flooding the sky. And I don't even think there was a moon, but it was just big, huge. And in a moment, it all dawned on me. It sounded like the Lord was very sweetly said to me, how big are your problems? How big am I? Well, my weeping turned to laugh, laughter. It really literally did. I said, they're nothing to you. I cannot mess this up so bad that you can't fix it. So good. <laughs> it didn't make me irresponsible, uh, but it changed my entire outlook. That God is bigger than any mistake I can possibly make, isn't he? I mean, he is God, after all. And this isn't too big for you, but I can't make that connection if I don't look at him. So worship becomes crucial to prayer. There are very few things in the Bible God seeks. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of him whose heart is perfectly his. Yes, he's looking for those fully his, fully surrendered him, fully given over to him. He does seek that. But remember John 4? The Lord seeks those who will worship him in spirit and truth. He seeks worshipers. Now, C.S. Lewis pointed out one time, well, if somebody's constantly wanting to be praised and constantly wanting to be worshipped, don't we think them a little bit egotistical or insecure? 
at least. Well, he figured that we know God isn't either one of those things. So why does he want you and me to worship him? It's for our sake. It's for our benefit that we're to worship him. It does all this for us. You're changed into his image. Your faith grows enormously more. And you're able to cope with life and cope with situations and cope with promises because you're going to see them through his eyes, not yours. And that's critical. I want to close with one passage that's, this chapter is one of my favorite chapters in all of the Old Testament. There's so much truth in it. It's Second Chronicles chapter 20. I think my dear wife used it with you ladies, I think, when she was on that retreat with you. But, and I'm not going through the whole chapter. I just want to give you the first start of it. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 20. This is Jehoshaphat. Suddenly he learns that armies are coming against him and they're probably a day's march from Jerusalem. No, no more than that. And he is in big trouble. Now, you'd think he would call the armies or get a war council and all that. But what did he do? In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 4, So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he turned his attention to his generals. No. He turned his attention to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Wow. That he would turn to the Lord like that. All right, now here's how he begins his prayer. Verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, the house of the Lord, before the new court. And he said, O oh Lord, God of our fathers, the sons of Moab and Ammon and Mennonites, they're coming to make war with me. No. Look what he says. Verse 6. O oh Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of nations? Power and might are in your hands so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O oh our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people? He's remembering what power God had and displayed in the past. Your people, Israel, and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. And they have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary there for your name. Now he's calling on the promises of God. And should any evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, you're faithful. You're going to keep your word. And we will stand before this house and before you for your name is in this house and cry to you in our distress. You will hear and deliver us. Only until then does he bring up the problem. He begins with worship. If you, it's a great study, is to go through the Bible and study all the recorded prayers in the Bible. And if you did that, you would discover a pattern here that they all, every one of them, begin with ascribing God's name to him, but they all begin in worship. Then they move to the requests. We know this is true. Psalm 100, verse 4, into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. The model prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It begins with worship. So, here's what I'm going to suggest to you. When you come to prayer... Yes, we need to remember we need him for everything at all times. But when you come to prayer and in your quiet times and your alone times, begin at least the first five minutes or more and do not ask for anything. It's going to be harder than you think. But do not ask for anything. Just worship him and admire him and glory in how great and good he really is. 
Only then, and maybe you won't go there at all that day, maybe you'll just rebel in the presence of God. You know, do you really need to inform him of what's going on? He already knows. The only reason you ask is so that you will have the joy of seeing him answer it. But he knows what you need before you ask. But to enjoy his presence and to revel in who he is, that is blessed. That tributary, just loving God and enjoying his presence is one of the biggest tributaries besides a profound sense of need that make a man or a woman a real intercessor before God. Well, let's pray. You, O oh Lord, are altogether lovely. We know that, like David, he, he, just, he didn't say, I just want to behold the power of God or the infinitude of God. He, he, he said he wanted to behold your beauty. You are beautiful. And we want eyes to see you more and more and to worship you. And we're so thankful that pleases you that you seek such worshipers. Make us such, we pray. And we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.